I think we can go ahead and start. We'll just uh, set our motivation. Sanghe chudam sugi chunam na janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi drola pinche sanghe drupa show sanghe chudam sugi chunam na janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi Rola penchia sangue drupa show. Sangue shudon sogi chunama. Janchu padu dane capsuchi. Dagi chun yangi pe sonam ki. Rola penchia sangue drupa So yesterday we were looking mostly at lower tantras and we were looking at the meditation techniques that are not obvious or apparent in the practice manuals, the idea of yoga with sign and yoga without sign. And we drilled down then a bit more deeply into yoga with sign. And we were looking at how self-generation goes with the six deities. And then we did the um, abridged Nume practice. So that abridged, um, you know, really shortened Chenrezig practice that has the six deities where first you're meditating on emptiness and then from emptiness, the sound, et cetera, et cetera. How did that go for you guys? Was that something that um, felt like a natural progression and you could kind of connect with it or did it feel kind of confusing or um, how did it land when we did that yesterday? I felt the connection um well whether i could repeat it i'm like oh, i don't know but yeah so i think having you know having the book to rehearse so to speak but yeah it was very, thank you very much sure and i can send you these um powerpoint slides if they're useful um so um, agnes i think we'll send them to you after the course i'll send them to her and she'll forward them on but um, thank you thank you and of course, you can get the full Nungne Sadhana from the FPMT store, but it's it's a lot. And if you're by yourself, it's sometimes hard to have the momentum unless you already are quite familiar with the practice. So sometimes it's nice to have an abridged one. We're going to do another Chen Rezig practice today that is actually simpler, but has some more connections with the five Buddha families. And this simpler one that we're going to do it's really, it's like three pages, it's really short, but um, it's the sort of one that might not be too intimidating to do every day, right? Because it's so short. And a lot of us have the commitment or at least the advice to do a lot of Om Mani Peme Hums every day. Um, maybe we have the, the commitment to do, you know, 10 malas a day, or maybe we've heard Lama Zopa Rinpoche say how powerful you become to others, what a positive impact you have on others when you're doing, you know, hundreds or thousands of Omani Peme Homes a day, even if you're not in a particularly good mood, right? Not even if you're not in a particularly great space, that mantra has such power that if you top it up every day, it's really gonna have a huge impact on your mind, but also you as a condition for others. So sometimes just doing the mantras straight without a practice manual to kind of hold it or contain it can feel less inspiring. So this little one that we're gonna to do today is a nice one to plug in your manis because it's short, but it's still quite powerful. Um, and then I thought I would go a little bit into the other two meditations related to yoga with sign and then yoga without sign. And talking about lower tantra is a little bit easier in a public setting. There's less secrecy um, because it's less easy to misunderstand. So we can kind of talk a bit more openly about these practices, even though normally this is kind of edging into commentary land we're not doing straight commentary. No one's taking anyone as a teacher. We're just all friends here. <laughs> okay, so in case part of you was wondering, oh no, Yintin's teaching commentary. I don't know if I want her to be one of my teachers yet. Ah, seems nice and everything, but we just met. <laughs> don't worry, we're just um, having a conversational peer collaboration kind of group 
And um, I think probably in a group like this, we could each just take turns facilitating a meeting with our own um, knowledge base and it could be really lovely. And I always hope that Dharma centers do more of that where they kind of use the resources of the community. And, you know, there's bound to be someone who's quiet in the corner for 20 years, but it turns out they know a ton about Tara, you know, and they just like floods of knowledge. So, um, so I do hope that you guys use each other as a community. All right, so we're gonna just review a little bit that six deities because that's a really important piece. So as I'm reviewing it, just think, when you did the practice yesterday, did you get stuck anywhere? And, um, and then we'll move on to new stuff. Okay, so these were embedded in the Chen Rezig practice that we did. And they had nice tidy headings. Sometimes sadhanas don't have nice tidy headings, particularly if you're reading the Tibetan, the headings are sometimes not there. But um, all of these were in the practice. So we started with the deity of emptiness, and we're thinking myself, the deity, the practice are all empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. So this is not an invitation to space out or to think, and eh, nothing. It's not an invitation to do that. It's basically thinking any emptiness study that I've done in the past or analysis I've done in the past, I'm going to do a very abbreviated version of that and kind of click into where I left off with my understanding of emptiness. So it's like briefly analytical, but mostly kind of single pointedness with the concept. So it's a bit abstract because it's a quick meditation. You know, it's like 10 seconds, 20 seconds. If you're doing it on your own, you can stretch it out to a few minutes, but not so long that you lose clarity and vividness. But even just to think all is empty of inherent existence prevents you from becoming fundamentalist with the practice itself. So it's kind of just clearing all of that superstitious thought from the very beginning. So you just sit with all is empty of inherent existence. Then from emptiness, the sound of the deity's mantra resounds. So you're just hearing it in your mind's ear, you know, not with your actual ears. You're just imagining the sound of the mantra, just reverberating. And that's your object of single pointed concentration. It's just the sound of the mantra in your own head. And then the sound of the mantra takes the form of letters. And again, it can be any language as long as they represent those sounds. And you imagine that the sounds and letters mix like very pure mercury adhering to grains of gold as it says in the sadhana. So the sounds and the letters mix or merge. And then the mantra form transforms into the deity's body. So here you're thinking, Chen Rezig, um, if it's not perfect and precise, don't worry about it. There are so many factors that come into a clear visualization. Some of it is just if you're habitually a visual person, but a lot of it is merit and familiarity. So even if it's just a general impression of the shape of radiant white luminous light, and then gradually you can get some faces and some hands, just really gently build up the form. And then the places of the body are blessed with a mudra. So in the case of Chen Rezig, it's the lotus family. So lotus mudra, and you're blessing the various places of the body. And then this deity of symbol or sign, you place om, ah, hum at the places of the deity and then meditate on divine pride and clear appearance or aspiration if you don't have the empowerment. So as you're looking at those steps, do you feel like there's one that you'd like to unpack a little bit more or um, ask about? One thing about visualizing the deity. Mm. You know, often... Um... I visualize the deity as a statue above me. I find it really difficult to see the see the see it as a a living it's mm. a living deity. I just see this kind of visualize this statue. Mm. Yeah. So, any comments that would facilitate that? 
Well, I mean, it helps definitely if you've seen something as a reference, but you don't want to think of it as heavy and solid. What you really want to think is that it's made of light, it's transparent light, it's three-dimensional, yeah. and that it's alive. Mm -hmm. And I mean, sometimes just seeing, you know, some silly YouTube video, somebody is mocked up can kind of help give you a sense of it. Just don't make it too cartoony. <laughs> Right. And like some people who are tonka painters are very, very skillful. And some really do make the tonkas kind of like cartoons. And it's really unfortunate their artistic rendering doesn't live up to what we want to be of it. But it's still the sacred geometry and it's still the Buddha is there and we offer respect to it. But if you can find an artist's representation that you really connect with, like, can you visualize in the Mahamudra Gampa that huge Chenrezig tonka that's on the side? Do you yeah. remember that one, that huge one? Yeah. That, yep. that would even would be better than a statue because it's radiant white and it's got mm. all the, you know, kind of the facial features are really intensely present. Mm. So if you can take that and imagine it three-dimensional, gently, gently, but if it, it's not coming clear, just thinking light is okay. Yeah, I can see the light. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Light but it's just like... I'd like it to be a lot more alive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I hear you. And mm. use your imagination when you're not in practice sometimes can help. You know, if you're just like mm. going for a walk with the dog, just kind of like have some thoughts, like look out to the sea, look out to the bush and just kind of be like, what if Chen Rezig was standing there? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like make it mm. less pressurized, yeah. Okay. you know, with a really yeah. relaxed mind. So tonka painters are actually super helpful for learning about why this and how that, you know, llamas are amazing for so many things, but sometimes it's the tonka painters that will have the little micro details about your deity practice mm -hmm. that can help you really dive in and dig into those. So that can be fun to go to one of those courses, even if you're not an artist. But I bet you are. Thank you probably heard it before but I remember one time um, somebody asked a similar question Eleanor to, to Lama uh, Lama Yoshi and he said um, my recall of what he said was um, stop trying it's already there the vision you don't need to visualize it's already there so wherever you look there's Chen Rezig. just just recognize that it's there thank you yeah, mm. absolutely. And it's actually, it's the effort that is helping you build the concentration. Mm. You know, so the fact, like Wendy is saying, the fact that the deity is there, that's, that's an awareness we should be bringing as much as we can, because it helps us feel connected, right, sure. and held. But when we're doing the practice, the visualization um, is helping you build that com the combination of calm abiding and special insight. So the effort is more important than the, um, I guess, making it happen perfectly. So it's just like if you were watching the breath, right? You're, you're watching the breath and then you get distracted, you come back to the breath, right? Simple as that. And some days you notice you're distracted and you give in and you go off with the fairies into your distraction because your distraction is very entertaining, right? And that's a less good meditation. And a better meditation is, oh, I'm distracted and you come back. <laughs> right? Simple, you know, but with the deity meditation, it's like, don't force clarity, just bring your mind back to the intention to, yeah, so whether the details are there or not is really kind of incidental, because they, they actually sometimes build over time, and different deities might come clearer than others because of your karmic connection with them, too, but it's more like keep bringing your mind back to the intention to have it appear there, or there, or there, Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's yep. important. <clears throat> I saw an exhibition once in Hong Kong and it was holograms of deities. Mm -hmm. It was years ago. And they were they were in little kind of niches and then they were off and then suddenly they were on. And it was this, it was, it was so many years ago that it was very, very basic actually, but it was phenomenal. And I just suddenly thought. I don't know how, it just brought it to life for me. So Eleanor, when you were saying about it being living or life, I don't know if you've ever seen a hologram and now they're so good that they don't look that different to a person. But back then it was just kind of radiant green light and then suddenly nothing. 
just appearing, flashing on and off, you know. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention that, Eleanor, in case um, that might help. Yeah, it's a good use of technology. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So keep coming back to it's the intention more than the like achievement. A good meditation is when there has been relaxed effort. A bad meditation is when there's been no effort and giving up. So, so not so fixated on, I got it, but more fixated on I intended, because that's what's going to build the merit and the momentum. It, it's so tricky, isn't it, with meditations, because when it's hard, it's easy to give up and say, oh, I can't do this, it's hard. But it's even just the wanting to is building that momentum and say, oh, it is hard, that must mean it's new. <laughs> it doesn't mean I'm deficient, it just means it's new, <laughs> right? Can can you explain a little bit about breathing with the the that meditation in Geshe Tashi's tantra book? He he does talk about breathing, but yeah, I I've never really been able to connect the the visual with the with the breath. Um, if you can it's talk a bit about that. It's, you know, it, it's a like a, a next stage level practice when you add vase breathing. And where you would do it is not during the six deities, you would do it during the mantra recitation time. So it's, it's a way to develop calm abiding to kind of marry your mental recitation of the mantra with breath work. And vase breathing is, um, it's described, I think, fairly well in um, Becoming the Compassion Buddha. Correct me if I'm wrong, do you remember Wendy, maybe in Intro to Tantra, one of Lama Yeshi's books, he describes basic vase breathing in just several pages really beautifully. So mm -hmm. I would work on vase breathing as one project a little bit and then work on the mantra and then bring them together eventually. And probably the easiest is if you do it in a workshop scenario, the first time with someone walking you through it, but where you would do it is during the mantra recitation time. So that mantra recitation time is where you've got a lot of flexibility and options. So the normal way is, you know, you got your mala, you're doing Omani Peme Hum, one per each bead, you know, fast enough to keep you sharp and clear, but not so fast that you're getting anxious and tight, right? And that speed is going to vary person to person, but you are actually saying it out your mouth, <laughs> right? But so quietly that no one can hear you, especially if you're in a group retreat, because you will annoy them. Yes. So, you know, oh, money, pay me home, oh, money, pay me home, oh, money, pay me home, just under the breath. Right. And it's the pace is something that you as an individual will play with, because in the beginning, you're like, I have prayer beads. Oh, money, pay me home, oh, money, pay me, right? You're just like one at a time. And then you get so used to it, you're just like clicking them away, but you can get so speedy that you kind of start to lose clarity and you get into kind of a vague autopilot. So you want to really play with the speed and your approach to the recitation so that you're staying bright and clear. So that's the first level, right? So you're saying the mantra, holding the mala, and then you're connecting with radiating light, coming back in, light going out, light coming back in, right? So the light is purifying you, all your body, speech, and mind, light goes out, the tips of the light rays have whatever deity you're practicing, they send out offerings to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they transform all the sentient beings into that deity, light collects back, gathers into your heart and out <laughs> and in, you know, like a breath or a heartbeat, but at a speed that is really, um, gentle and in a flow that doesn't again feel too fast or too slow and that's very personal so that alone is incredibly powerful and that's the main meditation for pretty much all mantra accumulation stages in retreats but when you start getting used to the practice then you might shift from verbal recitation to mental recitation and when you have mental recitation then you can add breath work so then you stop talking, you know, stop having it come out, just hear the mantra in your head and start adding the breath work and as a way to develop calm abiding. Does that, does that help a little? Mm, yes, yeah. thank you, thank you. So with all these practices, even the simplest one, the simplest version of it is enough, is perfect, is powerful. And if you want to add layers, there are always more layers. 
and more to do and more to do. So it's not like I should be doing this more elaborate. Don't ever feel should. Feel like I could if I wanted to, if I wanted to build depth or I wanted to add a new skill to my meditation, that your same sadhana has so much flexibility that um, it'll never get old if you keep bringing in fresh perspectives on how to engage with it. All right, so, um, so we'll finish up on lower tantras and then we'll do a little meditation. Okay, so what we were looking at yesterday was yoga with sign, the concentration of the four branch repetition. And within that four branch repetition was the six deities. So all of that is stuff that you can read about, but mostly it's plugged into the sadhana fairly explicitly. The other two are not plugged into the sadhana explicitly. The other two are ones that you would have to add proactively, and you wouldn't necessarily know that they are possibilities unless you read the commentary. So the concentration of the yoga with sign abiding in fire. So the visualization is the details of the deity are what you're holding. And then specifically the moon disc at the heart, which is your mind, and then fire, which is emptiness. And you're holding inner mantra sound. So you're hearing the sound of Om Mani Pei Mehum in the case of Chen Rezig. And what you're doing is Vaz breathing with alternating visualizations. So you're kind of going to elaborate visualizations and simplified visualizations. Breath in, holding the breath. Breath out, you know, like this. And even though at first you're thinking of all the details of the deity, all the arms and the implements and the faces, you gradually simplify it to just moon disk and fire. And the benefits of this kind of meditation are, of course, developing calm abiding. But a side benefit is that you naturally have less dependence on food and drink. So it's not like you develop like a body dysmorphia issue and you start becoming anorexic. It's not like that. It's that you actually are able to derive more of the essence from food and drink. So you need less and less of it to be sustained. So you would stay at your same weight with less food and be able to feel as energized and vital with less food as a res as kind of a side effect of this practice. The huge benefit is, of course, calm abiding or shine shamatha. And then you have this bliss and pliancy that comes with calm abiding where your body is just at ease. Your body's not hurting. It's just got a flexibility and a blissfulness to it, which is not the same as the bliss we talk about in highest yoga tantra, but is more just kind of a natural possibility of this body when there's less stress and tension in it and the channels are flowing a bit more smoothly. So you have this kind of physical pliancy where your body's at ease and your mind is very calmly happy. So that would be nice, right? And then with this practice, you also have uh, ease with having warmth. It's not the same as tumo, inner heat, which is the warmth that you develop in highest yoga tantra, but you just notice that there's a more pervasive warmth in the body. It's uh, not as hard to stay warm. There's just a lot more vitality happening. So these are side effects of doing this practice, but the main intention is you want calm abiding so that you can have calm abiding with special insight focused on emptiness so that you can cut the root of samsara and go on to the other realizations to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So this meditation is a quick way to develop that calm abiding concentration. So this is from Geshe's book. Um, he says, this meditation is said to bring a practitioner's mind to full calm abiding. The previous meditations, such as the six steps of building up six self-generation will help, but alone, they are not powerful enough. This meditation is a special feature of the lower tantras. 
we can achieve calm abiding through highest yoga tantra or through sutrayana or even through non-Buddhist philosophies, but the methods are different. Lower Tantra gives us an extremely quick and skillful way of achieving this penetrating state. So that was the concentration of abiding in fire. And then very similar to it is the concentration of abiding in sound. So it's just a bit subtler and more nuanced. And here you have the deity with a deity at their heart with the fire and the moon disc at their heart. And still the moon disc is mind and the fire is emptiness, but it's a more subtle and refined visualization. And you're mainly holding the idea of the empty mantra sound as the flame. So you're slightly shifting the emphasis to emptiness rather than your single pointed concentration on the fire and the moon disc, you're thinking about the fact that those are empty and that the mantra that you're hearing in your mind is empty. So it's just a slight variation of your emphasis and the visualization is slightly more nuanced. And again, you're gonna have vase breathing with alternating visualizations, depending on if your breath is held or if your breath is released. So it's, um, it looks kind of complicated, but once you're used to say forearm Chenrezig, popping another forearm Chenrezig at his heart and the moon and the fire at his heart doesn't become such a difficult thing. And again, just having the idea that that's the case without all the details is okay. And mainly you're hearing the sound of the mantra and remembering that it's empty. So, it's said that when a practitioner is successful in abiding in sound, he or she will naturally and spontaneously hear the entire mantra without sequence. Think of the way we normally hear Om Mani Padme Hum. Om precedes the Mani, that precedes the Padme, that precedes the Hum. The successful practitioner hears all six syllables of the mantra at once, simultaneously, without distinction. This is the concentration of abiding in sound. Okay, so those are the yoga with sign, meaning you haven't realized emptiness yet. So there are different options to add or plug into the sadhanas that you're doing. The concentration on the four branch repetition, even though they're not explicitly signposted, they are all explicitly woven in to most sadhanas. Abiding in fire and abiding in sound are not, but they both go during the mantra recitation time. Those are both options to do during that section. And Geshe Tashi Sering's book and um, Lama Yeshi's book, Geshe Tashi Sering's book Tantra and Lama Yeshi's book Becoming the Compassion Buddha will be really good kind of companions if you're wanting to really go ahead and try. Um, but it's just good to know that during that mantra recitation time, there is so many things you can be doing. Part of the, what's off-putting is these words. These are new words. These are not words we're used to using. It's new vocabulary. And really when you get down to it, it's not particularly complex, but it's the sort of thing that I don't really wanna lead in a public forum. I would lead like in a workshop privately and not record it. Cause there's also just the chance that sometimes people jump in too quickly to these things and interesting things start happening with their chakras or scary things start happening. And every once in a while, someone will have some kind of psychotic episode and you wanna make sure that you're there to look after them if that happens. It's really, it's, it's very unlikely that that would happen unless you already have a predisposition to that or have had that happen in the past. But because there is a physical component and a mental component and it's a new kind of a technique, it can be a little bit of a can of worms, even though it's a relatively simple technique. Um, just like what we were talking about yesterday with nine round breathing, bringing up some emotion, then, you know, take something even more um, intense, brings up more stuff, <laughs> good and bad. Yeah, so it's interesting to know that it's there, um, but yeah, I'd wait for a workshop to get walk through it before you do it, mm -hmm. unless you're feeling quite confident already in your practice or you have some Dharma friends you can lean on if something goes awry. <laughs> yeah. Your friendly local Geshe can sort you out. 
Yes, I know, but I have a question. <laughs> so, because um, recently, actually last month, I finished the Nune practice, two round of Nune practice. I do feel what you said about less dependent on food and drink after mm -hmm. those sessions. And I have the feeling that I want to continue the Nune. Mm -hmm. However, because we, we live in a, <laughs> not a, yeah. not a nice that we can do Nune every day. So yeah. how can we like, do you have any suggestion that how can we practice Nune, not in a whole day practice or, yeah. I think that it, there's something important to realize, which is just in retreat, mm. you naturally have fewer needs mm. because your mind is going into a slightly more renounced state. And so you don't need quite as much food and that's amazing, but it's not actually the needing less food that comes from having calm abiding. Okay, mm -hmm. it's different. Mm -hmm. And so the, the danger is, is that you think, oh, good, my renunciation is holding me well, I need less food. And then you start working a little bit, you're going to need more food again. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you're moving from two different modalities. So, so it's actually kind of setting yourself up for burnout to work in that way and I really wouldn't do it really mm. try, you know what your aspiration is which is to practice all the time and offer service is mm. perfect is so beautiful but I wouldn't do it with Nune. Mm. the only way it would really work with Nune is if you were doing Nunes in a group and you were offering Nune related service you know like mm. you were the one chopping the vegetables at lunch some of the days, you know, or something like that. Like if you were in France when they do back to back to back new days, mm -hmm. you're obviously offering service then too, but it's all held and the mm -hmm. retreat schedule is something everyone is doing. And one of the hardest things in working at a Dharma center is if you have a totally different schedule than everybody else, it becomes jangly for you and jangly for them and um, can lead to kind of a an uncomfortable feeling between everybody so it's so important to have harmony i think it's really make make sure you have a similar kind of a schedule to people and if you love chen resig practice just do lots of chen resig practice but without the precepts yeah um, but if you want to do regular precepts, not Nune fasting precepts you can do precepts every day but if you do precepts every day back to back Lama has said, lots of teachers have said, it's okay to have breakfast if you're doing back-to-back -back precepts. Yeah, so if you're doing only one day precepts, you know, we just have lunch, but mm -hmm. if you're doing them every single day, make sure you have a really good breakfast too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, D does that help? I don't wanna, I don't wanna squash <laughs> your momentum, but I also, no. um, I, I have been where you are and I've burnt myself out and then it takes a long time to recover and then all sorts of time is wasted <laughs> in the recovery. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think people know me very well. <laughs> they don't. They they do really know me. Okay, I can burn out easily. Well, well, I give up a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, is, is that's, that's a good suggestion. Thank you, Fernando. Absolutely, but yeah, certainly doing Chen Resig practice every day is a beautiful idea. Yeah, I really recommend it. So those are the meditations you can add um, before you've realized emptiness, and then. The last one is quite straightforward, but we're going to have to work, get closer to realizing emptiness. So yoga without sign. These earlier meditations involved abiding in sound, right? The sound of the mantra in your head. This meditation is called bestowing liberation at the end of sound, because now we have gone beyond that to the direct realization of emptiness and liberation. So the non-conceptual realization of emptiness marks this stage and it's what makes it yoga without sign. So yoga without sign, we're simultaneously holding vividly clear appearance of the deity and the mandala and the actual realization of their empty nature. So it appears and we recognize it as empty at the same time. Now we're already doing an attempt of this all throughout the practice, right? Things appear, we remember they're empty. Things appear, we remember they're empty. Things dissolve into emptiness, they arise out of emptiness. We're doing that all throughout the practice. But at this point is when you actually have the realization. 
So all of that practice that we're doing is leading to being able to actually do it. So at this stage, we can clearly and easily hold ourselves as the deity, as well as the entire environment of the deity, the moon disc, the mantra garland, and so forth. Our entire practice is suffused with a strong sense that we ourselves and the objects of our meditation are all empty of inherent existence. With the basis of these two aspects, the clear appearance of the deity and environment and the emptiness of the objects of meditation, we can slowly start to engage in analytical meditation. First, we analyze the mandala and the actual deity element by element in order to fully determine whether there is a scrap of inherent existence within a single atom of them. So this is similar to sutra practices like the four establishments of mindfulness, where you're looking at all of the elements of the body and seeing that they're empty of inherent existence. So it's the same emptiness, whether it's sutra or tantra. Yeah, it's not a whole new kind of emptiness. It's that the objects are different. Because remember that emptiness does not exist divorced from something to be empty of, right? Because we're not talking about nihilism. We're not talking about nothingness. We have to always talk about emptiness in reference to something. So in the sutra tradition, we're looking at it in reference to the self or elements that we attribute to the self. In Tantra, we're looking at it in terms of this whole giant magical projection of the future that we've created. So it's like you're a tourist of your mandala, you know, and you're touring around your mandala and you're going, okay, north, empty of inherent existence. East, <laughs> empty of inherent existence. Me, white, four arms, a thousand arms, eye in each palm, also empty. You know, it, it's, it doesn't have to be that silly, right? But this is what you're looking at. It's the focal object, not the emptiness that's different. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so then how do you do that? You can either see or feel the falsity of the object of negation and how things seem to be concrete and then challenge that. Or you can go straight into the finding of the non-finding you use any of the techniques you've learned, maybe through the philosophical tenant schools, but the simplest one is just to be like, where, <laughs> how, why does this seem inherent? And the way you prove that it's not is you say, oh, okay, if you think you're inherently existent, show me that you rely on no causes or conditions. And that only works for impermanent things, but that's most things, okay? Then you think, all right, if you're inherently existent, then you obviously have no parts, no context, prove it. You look for parts and context, you will find parts and context. And then you go even more subtly and you say, hey, if you are completely inherently existent, then you have no basis to impute onto. You're just a self-existent thing that came out of nowhere. And that's obviously not the case either, right? So you just, you know where you're going, but you're not skipping the steps of actually checking that. And that's how learning things intellectually is vital, but not enough. You have to understand the philosophy of emptiness, but if you leave it as a philosophy and you know where you're going to, and so you just jump all the steps, you're not actually proving to yourself the way things are empty of inherent existence. Does so it make sense? So having the intellectual understanding clearly is very, very important, but then you actually have to walk yourself experientially through these different stages, whichever te techniques you're using. And when you do that, you kind of have to invite your habit to show itself, right? You have to kind of invite what is false to appear because we're so used to just believing in appearances, we don't even notice that it's a constant projection of ignorance. So you have to kind of say, all right, take for example, one of the millions of metaphors you've heard. Um, when you look at your face in the mirror, it looks like there's another face there, but you know it's not another face. You know it's a reflection. 
a cat does not know that, right? A cat goes, oh, another cat, and like wants to play or wants to fight or gets confused and ignores it, right? And a very, very smart cat will be like, I am a handsome cat, but it's a rare cat, yes? So when you are thinking of an analogy like that, you're thinking it appears one way, but exists another. I already know that, but the fact that I know that has not pierced through the veil. So this whole beautiful elaborate mandala, the deity, the guru deity, me merging with the guru deity, all of that feels like it's inherently existent. But I don't believe that it is, but I still project that it is. So I have to challenge that by letting it show itself. We can get very literal, even with Tantra, even though Tantra is so creative and so spacious and so experiential, we can get kind of literal about things and think, and now I've done it. You know, you've checked the boxes going through the parts of the sadhana and now it's done, you know? And it's not like that. It has to be real and lived. Yeah, it has to be yours. Um, reciting a mantra is not reciting a magic spell or sprinkling in ingredients. It's something very, very much a dependent arising. Yes, it comes from the enlightened minds of beings who have already practiced. It comes from your ability to speak them and the air of them. It comes from your teacher and the connection. It comes from so many dependent arisings and then it has great effect. It's not magically inherently having an effect. And sometimes some of the lamas will frame it as if it's almost inherent, like from the side of the object or from the side of the holy being, or from the side of the Buddha, this or that happens, or the power from the side of the mantra, they don't mean inherently. They just mean these are particularly charged images and objects, but not because they just magically are that way. They were built that way through countless causes and conditions from enlightened minds. And so we can access that. Does that make sense? So just you know, bringing in what you know of emptiness from Sutra to Tantra, it's just a different object. It's the same emptiness is the main point. All right, so sometimes it can help to bring in ideas you already know, like uh, from the Heart Sutra. So we have form is empty, emptiness is form. Thich Nhat Hanh would say, form is emptiness and emptiness is form is like wave is water and water is wave. So the full quote is, form is the wave and emptiness is the water. To think this, we have to think differently than many of us who are raised in the West were trained to think. In the West, we draw a circle, we consider it to be zero, nothingness. But in India and many other Asian countries, a circle means totality, wholeness. The meaning is the opposite. So form is emptiness and emptiness is form is like wave is water and water is wave. Form is not other than emptiness. Emptiness is not other than form. The same is true with feelings, perceptions, mental formations and consciousness because these contain each other. Because one exists, everything exists. Okay. So that's what we were looking at so far. And it, you know, now that it's all together in one place, hopefully there's some clarity, but the main thing is to know yoga with sign, our understanding of emptiness is conceptual. Yoga without sign, our understanding of emptiness is perceptual. Yoga with sign is basically talking about this one, the basis front generation, self-generation. And these two, vase breathing with visualizations, subtler vase breathing with visualizations. And here are the three lower tantras, which are basically the same. We mostly do Kriya Tantra in our tradition. We do a little bit of yoga tantra, particularly Kunrig with prayers for the dead and stuff like that. So that's the main stuff about the three lower tantras.